I was asked in my first term at Oxford to do a sketch in this uh, one night show at the Oxford Playhouse uh, and I'd never written anything um, and I'm not really naturally a writer so I just had to invent a sort of, you know, five minutes of something at 48 hours notice I just stood in front of the mirror and started to mess about with my face basically and this strange surreal non-speaking character evolved Mr. Bean is is the name given to the to the skin that Rowan can put on to be funny. You've got a character who is quite intelligent and subversive, but you've also got a character who looks odd and behaves in an odd way and has odd solutions to problems. <laughs> Anarchist, unintentionally, I guess. Though he's not trying to create chaos, and he's just trying to make his own life work. You like a try to house wine, sir? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm driving. <laughs> He can be pretty mean and actually do some truly unpleasant things. <laughs> He's just able to make something out of nothing. And, and his, his physical humour, what he does with that face... The story of Bean is inextricably linked with the story of Rowan Atkinson. Although Mr. Bean was only christened in 1989, Rowan has been developing the character for most of his life. Whenever we try to think of Mr. Bean and how he will react or would react in, in certain situations that we're thinking of putting him in, I, I always imagine him as a nine-year-old boy. That's how I always see him. They're sort of anarchists at heart, really, and I think that's what Mr. Bean is. He's an anarchist. He'll obey the rules as long as they suit him. Rowan Atkinson was educated at Durham Cathedral Choir School. He is still remembered by his old headmaster, Canon Grove. I had a member of staff named Cyril Watson who produced plays, and one year he chose St Joan. And it was obviously a spark of genius on his part to see that Rowan was the perfect person for the Dauphin. It was quite camp. I seem to remember the first and possibly last time I've ever played someone truly camp. Shaw's own description was that the Dauphin was a pathetic little creature, yet irrepressible, with a cheeky sense of humour and always liable to get his own way in the end. And that... Uh, could be a sort of scenario for Mr. Bean. <laughs> what the hell do you think you're doing? Pinching my bottom in a hospital queue. <laughs> the first impression he gave was that he was an extremely shy little boy. Yeah, I want to Though he did say that he had begun his sort of career by being taken by the boys down into the change room 
and asked to make family faces for them. I seem to remember standing up in the in the changing rooms when I was ten or eleven or something and putting on a performance. Ainsley, Babcock, <laughs> Bland, <laughs> Carthorse, <laughs> Dint, <laughs> Ellsworth Beast Major. I think it's very likely that the funny faces of myself and my colleagues. Jones M, Orifice Sediment and Under Manager. See me afterwards. <laughs> Most of you, of course, didn't write nearly enough. Dint, your answer was unreadable. Put it away, plectrum. <laughs> if I see it once more this period, plectrum, I shall have to tweak you. <laughs> Don't sulk, boy, for God's sake. Has matron seen those boils? <laughs> I seem to remember making people laugh, but of course that was pre-adolescence, and I think once adolescence set in, that I never really performed off stage or off screen ever again. It, it was only before the self-consciousness set in. I think I was quite sort of self-contained, not I hope a loner, but sort of not really requiring the constant company of my friends in order to enjoy myself. Ooh. <laughs> My interest in visual comedy was based on discovering a film by Jacques Tati called Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, which I discovered when I was in the sixth form at school because I was the projectionist. And myself and a friend were in, were in charge of that operation and it enabled us to sort of leaf through film catalogues and order whatever films came into our minds. It just struck a chord with me. I, I so admired it. It was a, a kind of an uncompromising comic attitude and setting that I that I really admired. And so that, but that was only a filmic experience, which influenced me kind of subliminally. Monsieur. 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 Huh? Monsieur. 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 Monsie
at night? Or, or what? Well, uh, as a rule, yes. Aha! I... Ah, yes. Yes, well, uh... Yes, well, I do, actually. I, I, I quite often go to a pub on my way home. But tonight I thought I'd really splash out on something a lot better. Go somewhere really nice. Oh. <laughs> Would you like me to join you? No, 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 don't trouble yourself. No, it'll be, uh, um... Uh, yes? <laughs> yes, yes, if that'd be OK. In his very first term at Oxford, Rowan had a fortuitous meeting with a student comedy writer. I saw this little advert in the university newspaper saying we're thinking of getting a comedy review together, you know, meetings at university college at a certain time. So I thought I'd beetle along because I felt as though I had an interest. And, um, and Richard was there. Yes, Rowan and I met at a um, tiny scriptwriters conference in a Don's room. In the summer of... 1976 um, and I remember he was very bright very talkative which I wasn't because he, he was very quiet he didn't say anything for that for the entire two hour meeting but he's kind of m made up for, for whatever contribution I, I was uh, I, I was lacking from me and then finally one day uh, we were asked whether we had anything we wanted to put into the review that we were going to do and Rose stood up in the room and performed these two sketches that he'd worked out, uh, which were um, replete with such flagrant genius. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was the first time we heard him speak. Uh, they were completely wonderful. The Oxford Playhouse provided a showcase where Rowan performed much of his early material with Richard as the straight man. At the centre of the Elizabethan world sits the king. <laughs> Upon the character of the king depends the plot, and so there are many different kinds of king. The benign king. The benign king with a physical defect. The benign king with two physical defects. The mad king. Somebody who saw one of these early shows was BBC producer John Lloyd. It was not like any review that I had ever seen because, partly because of Richard Curtis's genius, it, the, the lateral jumps it made in, in terms of subject matter, it would always just start, you know, and often very surreal and rather European, like sort of strange. He used to describe them as Czechoslovakian cartoons where this little man would come on and be chased around the stage by a, a spotlight um, with the music of a clarinet playing. It didn't obey any of the rules of student sketch writing. It didn't appear to be like anything else. It wasn't like what we were all doing at the time as Monty Python sketches. <laughs> and very beguiling and odd. And then suddenly this fantastically rude vicar talking about blowjobs, you know. And a young, attractive bride-to-be came up to me after a service and asked me just that question. Father... What is the church's attitude to fellatio? And I replied, well, you know, Joanne, I'd like to tell you, but unfortunately, I don't know what fellatio is. <laughs> and so she showed me. <laughs> and ever since, whenever anyone has asked me the question, Father, what is the church's attitude to fellatio? I always reply... Well, you know, I'd like to tell you. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't know what fellatio is. The, the shows usually took the form of something very visual, sort of mime thing, a famous mime with a... where he mimed to a sort of Beethoven piano sonata. Another of Rowan's long-term collaborators is composer Howard Goodall. 
He is very musical. And we've always done a lot of musical sketches on the stage show, which is probably why I've been more involved than musical directors normally are in a comedy show. Um, he did one where he was a concert pianist playing Beethoven. He did one as a conductor. He did an um, ACDC guitar mime, and he did a thing called drumming, which we worked on together. <coughs> Well, I was uh, I was friendly with R Richard Curtis, and he was in those days uh, Rowan's straight man. Um, in fact, he was, as I later became, the other person in Rowan's one-man show. Good evening, and welcome to the Boston University Hunting. There were a number of different sketches, different characters, all of which had elements of what later became Mr. Bean. Uh, I can remember one uh, when he was. Uh, uh, a uh, sketch about someone on his first date. The first crucial step is having arranged to pick up your date, not to look like a complete idiot when she opens the door. <laughs> Best to look as though your attention has been momentarily distracted. <laughs> but when you do notice her, it is vital to say how pretty she is looking straight away. But don't overdo it. <laughs> He is very, very careful about everything he does. He works out everything in advance. And it'll be the same performance every night. But it was much more like preparing a play. Uh, and I think in that regard, he is more like an actor than a comedian, that, that he'll work out... He'll spend, you know, a long time working out uh, the dynamics of a particular scene. Well, once in the car, there are various ways of driving. If you drive like this... You, you might lose her respect if you drive like this. And there was a TV show called Canned Laughter, which he did very shortly after leaving Oxford. Um, and there, if you look at the character, you can see how it's gradually forming. Hi, Why do you think he hates Lorraine. You, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> he ties you up a lot. Oh my God! Look at the time. Richard Curtis and I were writing a, a full stage review for Rowan with lots of different sketches, and we wrote a couple of silent ones for him, uh, one of which was called Cheating, which I was, was particularly involved in, and, well, you know, we co-wrote the whole show. And um, that later became a Mr Bean sketch. It didn't change, really, at all. It's just that we didn't actually call it Mr Bean at the time. I think what he did is to take elements of those different characters um, and package them together. And that's, I think, probably how Mr Bean was born.
at 22. You're touring with one of the great comic geniuses of the century. <laughs> and you're still 22, and you're three friends. So how do you handle that? Because obviously the minute Rome walks on stage, he has 5,000 people or 3,000 people in the palm of his hand. Uh, and it's an extraordinary gift, and we don't really discuss it very much, but that's what's happening. Ah, uh, hello. It's nice to see you all here. <laughs> now, as the more perceptive of you probably realised by now, this is hell. <laughs> and I am the devil. Good evening. Uh, but you can call me Toby, if you like. We, we try to keep things informal here, as well as infernal. Uh, um, that's just a little joke of mine. <laughs> I tell it every time. Now, murderers, murderers, over here, please. Thank you. Uh, looters and pillagers, over here. Thieves, if you could join them, and lawyers. You're in that lot. <laughs> Villains are always more fun to play than good guys. That's a well-known fact. Um, and uh, I enjoy characters who have a vindictiveness in them. Well, I always have done it. In the end, it's just more fun. There was a very funny moment when I first sent him the script of the tall guy, and the character that he eventually played was at that point called Rowan Atkinson, <laughs> just as a joke. <laughs> and he rang me up and asked me which part um, I wanted him to play. It was somewhat based on his real life, I guess, experiences with Richard Curtis, who wrote The Tall Guy, brilliant man that he is, and, uh, and uh, funny script that it is. And Because he played something of the same part uh, in Rowan, uh, Rowan's one-man show. I think the rest of us found it quite difficult to adjust to the fact that he was becoming very famous very quickly and we were still who we were. Um, and this was way before Richard had become a well-known writer in his own right, so I think there was quite a lot of adjustment to be done uh, in terms of that. And I think, especially for Rowan, I, you know, difficult for him to adjust as his friends were always wondering whether he was going to buy the meal or not. The only thing in which Rowe was naughty during um, the uh, stage show is he did have a lot of trouble describing it as anything but a one-man show. Uh, I remember saying to him once, you know, pointing at the, the poster which said Ryan Atkinson in his one-man show and saying, I don't think that, that, that poster's slightly strange. Um, and he said, oh, yes, yes, that typeface should be in green and not yellow. So I thought, well, I won't, I won't push it. Lloyd asked if I wanted to join this team of people he was getting together to do a new topical, satirical comedy sketch show. The BBC, who in those days were much more paternal than they are now, um, said to Rowan, it would be much better if you had some other people in the show, because then if you're good, you'll shine, and if you're not good, they'll support you, and it'll mean you don't have to do a quarter of the work. So I was at this crossroads, really, and I... I had to choose between doing a show on my own or doing a show with three others. And, uh, and there was no doubt in my mind which, which way to go. Abu ben Adhem, may his tribe increase. Awoke one night from a deep dream of peace. And saw within the moonlight in his room. <laughs> <laughs> and to the presence in his room, he said, What writest thou? The vision raised its head. And with a look made of all sweet accord, answered, <laughs> It was only rarely in Not That Unclock News that, you know, that my, my special interest in visual comedy I was ever allowed to burst through. The rest of you will watch a mime called And If There's Any Sniggering There'll Be Trouble <laughs> Alternative Car Park. <laughs> I said... What? 
Well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> right, get on with the mime. I am a mime. My body is my tool. <laughs> the ideas we had for visual characters were, you know, rather unfocused, let's say. Uh, but the man who bumped into the tree was one of those rare occasions when it sort of got through. I can remember Richard Curtis and Rowan coming in very early, not the 9 o'clock news, and saying, we've got this great, great script, it's the best script we've ever written. And it consisted of, it says, Rowan is walking down the street and he sees the camera and then bumps into a lamppost. And I turned over the page, expecting the, the great delivery of the line. I said, well, what's this? What's the joke? He said, well, it's really funny. I said, this isn't funny at all. It's hopeless. It doesn't work at all. And they said, well, can we do it? Please, 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 can we have a, you know, a couple of hours with the camera? And I said, sure. They went off and shot it with the director. It came back, and it was absolutely brilliant. It's that shock that you've been working comedy for five, five, six, seven years and somebody comes along and says, there's another way of doing this. <laughs> he has not had to compromise. He's done pretty much exactly what he wants to. The compromises he's made have generally been so as not to upset his mother, you know, not to say too many rude words because she might not like it. It started off as being something completely different about uh, bicycle thieves in in North London, and over time it developed into this into a medieval sitcom. So <laughs> how it how it went down that road, I don't know. I seek information about a wise woman. <gasps> the wise woman. The wise woman. Yes, the wise woman. <laughs> Two things, my lord, must ye know of the wise woman. Yes. First, she is. A woman! <laughs> and second, she is... Wise? <laughs> you do know her, then? No, just a wild stab in the dark, which is incidentally what you'll be getting if you don't start being a bit more helpful. I delighted in Blackadder and those very long, ornate things, you know... Baldrick, that's the most disgusting thing I've seen. Since Cardinal Wolsey got his knob out at Hampton Court... <laughs> and stood at the end of the passage pretending to be a door. <laughs> oh, shut up, Baldus. You'd laugh at a Shakespeare comedy. The Blackadders were very complicated by the end, it has to be said, because um, there were, you know, six or seven people working in a room, all of whom were capable, on their own, of developing entire projects, attempting to squeeze all their creative energy into a two-dimensional situation comedy. Permission to sing boisterously, sir. If you must. <laughs> row, 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 you punt gently down the stream. Belts off, trousers down, is a life a scream. <laughs> Fabulous. University education, you can't beat it. <laughs> now, what have we here? Name? Baldrick, sir. Go oh, telly ho, yibbity dap and zing zang spillet. Looking forward to bullying off for the final chucker? <laughs> answer the general, Baldrick. I can't answer him, sir. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, are you looking forward to the big push? No, sir. I'm absolutely terrified. <laughs> The healthy humour of the honest Tommy. <laughs> Don't worry, my boy. If you should falter, remember that Captain Darling and I are behind you. About 35 miles behind you. <laughs> there are two, uh, two Rowan characters, principally. There's the absolute bastard, who's the, the schoolmaster character, or Blackadder. And there's the funny, wibbly little man. <sighs> <laughs> He 
is actually an utter bastard as well. They're both bastards. In 1989, after the consideration of a long list of vegetables, the funny little wibbly man was given the name of Mr. Bean. Quite unexpectedly, this unfashionably silent comedy was an immediate hit. <laughs> One of the secrets of the Bean visual humour is the careful and highly detailed preparation that goes into filming. I'm not at all sure that I enjoy acting because I just find it so worrying and difficult. I enjoy planning things, I enjoy thinking about things and, you know, contributing to the creation of things. ...the window down or a head emerging if you wanted a nice entrance for yourself, trying to get out of the train. Almost without seeing, seeing the window come down, just, just, just the sense of the grappling hand of the hand coming out, you know, yes. with, where's the norm? Each and every Bean moment is meticulously choreographed. I don't know, I don't know. I suppose I'd seen that he arrives in this shot already sort of faltering, you know what I mean? That we just get the sense, or at least not, not necessarily that he's acknowledged his loss of ticket in the opening shot, but he could be looking for it. And I'm still fairly confident. Yeah. And then when we pick him up profile, that yeah. he's sort of starting to falter and, and there's a little bit more of the hook. Yeah. If this angle works best, that's lovely. The change of direction, if you see what I mean. <laughs> I'm always aware that of any ten suggestions I might come up with, three or four or five, maybe along the same lines that he's thinking. Um, but I'm always unnerved by the fact that on almost all the other occasions he's so far ahead that I then have to choose between, you know, um, open-mouthed admiration or a very quick recovery where I say, yes, I felt something similar would, would probably do very well and then scuttle off and try and get to the cameraman before he does. <laughs> this bag could do with being six inches... Six inches longer. Six inches longer? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> How fast can you go? <laughs> so one corner of the bag would go through and get stuck, and then, uh, 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 and then he'd come back, and then think, well, there's only one way out, and that is to go over the top. The co-writer, Robin Driscoll, collaborates with Rowan on the improvisation of Bean. Might be nice tea bag. You know, if you do a bit of a caterpillar and you get up and you think, well, freedom's inside. <laughs> One of the reasons why Mr Bean has gone on is because actually the process of creating him is quite a lot of fun. You think of a basic situation, just as you're walking around, you're in a barber shop, and you think, yes, this is a place where people don't talk to each other. I could do a Mr Bean thing here. <laughs> Susie! And then you sit down at the computer and you think through, as you would with a normal piece of writing, five things that might happen. in the shop back there. But just give him a good haircut, will you? Be good, Jamie. Sorry to stop, but I have a feeling that if this happened, that Bean would... Or these, some, you know, normal people would say, hang on a minute, <coughs> he'll be back in a second and I'm first. You know what I mean? But, uh, they'd be, because in the end, the real barber's only ten yards that way. Mm. So he would, I'm not sure he would immediately presume to take on the role of a barber unless he had, he had an extra kick. Um, um, I mean, maybe actually Jamie says something like, come on! Would Jamie take his own cap off and, uh, and look, look at Bean so that we see you? Yeah, like that expectant thing. Yeah. And there's a kind of moment between the two of you. Yes. Yes, that might be quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's chap, quite, yes, you know. that's quite good. Yes, exactly. Good. Yeah, that might be all I need. I like 
Mr Bean, mainly because he's got a bit of a rubber face. Peas up the turkey's bum, and then um, he put, he puts it up with hands. He's got his watch on, and when he comes out, you realise he's not wearing his watch. on his head and when his girlfriend comes they, f they find out <laughs> Are you alright in there? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you <laughs> well, I reckon he's a bit gormless Good evening, call it bean o -mania. Let out of them, yes Mr. Bean! O como una lubia y se llama eso, Mr. Bean. Nous verrons bientôt sur France 3, Mr. Bean. Que... Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bean. Uninhibited by a language barrier, Mr. Bean has become a truly global success and is now watched in over a hundred countries around the world. The character was always meant to be international. The inspiration came to Rowan while on holiday in Italy. I just remember strolling through Venice and seeing all these souvenir stores selling uh, posters of George Michael and Phil Collins and um, and Duran Duran, I think, at the time, and thinking, well, well, there you go, you know, Englishmen all, but hordes of Norwegians are very keen to buy posters of them. Why does comedy not have an international dimension? And with Mr Bean, Rowan has undoubtedly discovered that international dimension. Uh, I've, never, I've never been to Canada before, and it's absolutely splendid. Bean is not quite into sex, drugs and rock and roll, but the Bean videos have sold in record-breaking quantities, and Rowan is now as well-paid as a major rock star. All this on the back of only 14 Mr Bean half-hour episodes. Well, I certainly never wanted pop star recognition and accoutrements. In fact, we did experience it once in, in, in Amsterdam when I went as Mr Bean to sign some videos and there was this kind of, you know, near riot and I had to be smuggled out of the back of the stores. A most uh, peculiar thing, you know, when you get a sense of that, you know, what it must be like to be Madonna. Uh, but I have to say it was an experience that I didn't enjoy at all. But despite this extraordinary success, Rowan was keen for a new challenge. Bean the movie offered a whole new set of possibilities and in 1996 it went into production. Reset. The Grierson Gallery of California needs a representative of our great gallery. They are looking for a scholar of the very highest standing. I have therefore decided to recommend for the post and the three months sabbatical that goes with it that splendid employee, Mr. Bean. Our loss is America's gain. Ludicrously nominated by the National Gallery as their representative, the funny little Wibbly Man finally arrives in America. Thank 
he gets a bit of a warm reception at Los Angeles Airport and immediately gets on the wrong side of the police. <laughs> You, sweetie? The structure and narrative of a film, if you're, if you're aiming to make it any kind of success, has got to be so different to that of a half-hour television program. It is a huge leap to make. Um, and if we were going to go th through all the effort and torment of making that leap and trying to make it work that it seemed logical that we should try to be doing something different with the character uh, which goes back again to this idea of trying to explore more facets of the character than we had been able to, to do on television just because it's a film we mustn't allow ourselves not to put in straight funny visual sequences and so we've had about eight days of rehearsal where we go into a rehearsal room and the three of us just fool around with basic ideas mr bean on the plane mr bean with a pair of wet trousers mr bean in bed you know and stuff like that and a lot of the funniest things indeed in the final movie when i suspect come from those genuinely amusing occasions rather than sitting alone in one's room typing speeches for people. Well done, you go. That's fantastic. Lean away from him. Rowan has always been more comfortable working within a close circle of collaborators, and Mel Smith, director of The Tall Guy and co-star of Not the Nine O'Clock News, was an obvious choice to direct the Bean movie. In the TV uh, programmes, there are no real consequences to what he does. I mean, there are consequences in the short term, within the ten-minute sketch or whatever it may be, to the people who are in the vicinity. Um, the interesting thing about doing a film is that there are real consequences in our story. And what he does actually impacts on other people. Are you feeling lucky, punk? Here? In our house for two months? Oh, David, what? Suddenly there's no hotels in Los Angeles? Okay, there's no need to get excited here. I just thought, you know, this is the Royal National Gallery of England's top man. I thought it'd be very exciting to have a round to learn from and uh -huh. talk to. And... So do we know anything about our new best friend? No, I think they might have mentioned it if he was a notorious serial killer. He's a genius, huh? That's what they tell me. Well, it looks like a fruitcake to me. The comedy is so simple, you know, it is so accessible. It's so manifest, really, to anybody. Some people who prefer a bit more, more intellectual content are probably disappointed by most uh, Mr. Bean's sketches and may therefore be disappointed by the film. But, I, uh, but that doesn't worry me so much. I, I enjoy the simplicity of him and his comedy and the, um, the sort of universal identification, I think, that, uh, that people throughout the world seem to feel for the character. <laughs> Wake up. I don't know what to say about Bean. He's clearly a Force 10 disaster area, but... God, help me. I like him. I mean, quite a lot of Bean is very extreme. But quite a lot of the stuff that I like the most is when he's just sitting in a chair in a dentist's waiting room with sort of nothing much going on and just watching him and how he, how he, how he bides his time always amuses me greatly.
I think Mr. Bean is, um, is Rowan Atkinson. I mean, I've sort of seen him uh, be that person in his own life. Uh, so I think, you know, they're not that far apart. If you're going to present a situation visually, I think the character or the personality that you create in order to present visual comedy comes from, where, from very deep within you. It's very identifiable as a part of you, which leads to my theory that actually that you have only one truly good and convincing visual comedy character within you. Nobody has more than one. <laughs> sometimes speculate about where I'd be now if I hadn't, you know, decided to take that plunge and write to those agents and take it seriously. And whether I'd be, you know, in some small research laboratory near Swindon doing, doing amateur dramatics every three months. And I'm sure I would be enjoying it greatly.